Hello everyone, my name is Tom Matcham. I'm a data scientist and programmer in the UK, in England specifically. Um, I would like to talk today a little bit about why I'm trying Jai or Jonathan Blow's language for effectively data science. Um, I've called it data focused programming here simply because um, I think if, if the community of data scientists want one language, um, to do basically everything, i.e. getting data from devices onto um, into databases and use for building models, then um, I think it's a good candidate. And so that's what I mean by data-focused programming, really. It's just that whole ecosystem around moving data around from places to places and building things with it. So very briefly, I will give a very brief introduction to Jai. I'll talk about the state of data science and all the other stuff that goes along with it or around the periphery, machine learning, deep learning analytics, data engineering, the whole the whole shebang. Um, why I think Jai is a potential good language to do these things in, um, better than any option that we have at the moment. Maybe not the best at each individual thing, um, with some exceptions actually. I think there are some areas where it could be the best, but certainly if we're going to go for a language which is which is going to be the, sort of the one language through them all, I think it's a good candidate, and hopefully I'll make a case for why that is. Um, in line with that, I've built a demo of a um, neural network library, a deep learning library, a very, very simple one, bear in mind with none of the bells and whistles that you're going to get with something like TensorFlow, but very similar API to TensorFlow and, um, you know, something that you could, um, you know, an example network that you could build in TensorFlow, and so similar capabilities. And then finally, next steps of where I'd like to take my sort of little attempt at improving my ecosystem, my day-to-day -day, um, life, essentially, doing these sorts of things. So Jai, um, I probably will only make this listed, uh, I'll make this video unlisted and we'll just post it on the Discord. But in case I decide not to do that, um, Jai is a programming language developed by games designer and developer, Jonathan Blow. Um, I've been following the project for at least five years. I can't remember exactly when I started to be interested in Jai. Um, but the reason why I was interested in it or I came across it is that I worked in the games industry for a number of years um, as a data scientist, um, producing unsuccessful middleware for the games industry using machine learning. Um, turns out games designers aren't interested in machine learning, um, or maybe that's just down to my inability to sell ideas. Um, so through my sort of workings with the games industry and doing some sort of game development as well, um, I came across some concepts which made a lot of sense to me, which were being espoused by the likes of um, Casey from Handmade Hero and Jonathan and um, Sean Barrett. And these concepts made sense to me. They, um, they resonated with my experience of programming and my frustrations of programming systems, um, or not systems, programming um, video games and programming tools for video games and also doing data science work. And so I've, I've sort of maintained that attitude as I've really focused in on just doing data science. So now I um, work in a UK consultancy firm doing a data science consultancy effectively or machine learning AI consultancy. Um, my frustrations that I felt when I was building tools for the games industry using machine learning, I still feel now when I'm my day-to-day -day life is really just focused on machine learning, data science, et cetera, et cetera. So the thing that attracts me about Jai and the principles behind it are it's low level when it needs to be, or, or it can be low level when it needs to be. So you have direct, uh, you know, you're not babied with your, for example, memory management. You're expected to know how to handle pointers and, and what to do with them and be comfortable with pointer arithmetic when necessary. Um, but also it allows for some really nice high level abstractions of, of, um, concepts that we do actually like um, you know and we find useful on a day-to-day -day basis what we want is we want high level abstractions which are um, appropriate and also um, don't come with so many side effects and and drawbacks which we're used to with say um, a, a functional programming language for example um, where the level of abstraction say for example in something like Haskell is so far removed from anything that uh, you can understand from a computer point of view that it's, it's it's basically two different worlds. So my frustration with programming um, in other languages 
um, reached a peak, I would say probably a month and a half ago now, uh, to the point where I contacted Jonathan to see if I could get access to the beta. He very kindly uh, allowed me access. Um, that particular experience was trying to simply run over, I think, some, somewhere in the order of 3 million rows of a effectively a, a Excel spreadsheet, you can imagine, doing a fairly simple computation, effectively finding the inverse of a, of a simple function. And I was waiting around for half an hour um, for that computation to run. And I, I, I couldn't understand why this was the case. This is something which is, you know, this is an absolutely trivial example of what computers are meant to be good at. Um, which is running over arrays. Um, I was I was just effectively doing an operation over a column of a, of a spreadsheet, essentially. Um, not in the spreadsheet, obviously, in, a, in R, which is a, a statistical programming language. But that was the point where I was like, I, I need to do something now. I need to change things up. I, I, can, I can wait no longer. So that's a little bit, very, very little bit about Jai. I'm assuming that we all know what it is and there are there are some other videos I mean there's Jonathan's videos obviously and and there are some other videos on YouTube which are, are very helpful in getting an introduction to the uh, I suppose philosophy of the language um, so now most I imagine most of you will not be familiar with data science there will probably be a familiarity with the problems of the games industry and producing software in, in uh, you know video games um, at pace too hard you know hard deadlines in some cases why do I think this works or the, the same problems exist in data science and perhaps even worse problems in data science, I would say. And so here's a quick summary of what the process of getting data to a, say, a machine learning model would look like. First of all, you have to ingest data uh, and that will be probably sent from some device external to your organization. Sometimes it is, but say, for example, you are doing data science in a video game studio. Um, you need to have something on your client, which is sending data over the web, uh, sorry about that, um, over the web to um, your servers, essentially. And when that data reaches something which is in your control, you will need to um, probably determine where that data should go. Now, this is considered sort of ingestion in the industry is the standard term for this. Um, I've In the brackets under each of these bullet points, I've put... Um, a standard technology which is used in the industry for um, these these tasks. Um, ingestion is one of these funny things which feels like it shouldn't be a problem. Um, I know, for example, that um, there are games companies which deal with huge quantities of data moving back and forth from clients to servers, um, which don't rely on these sorts of brokering systems, as they call them. Kafka is essentially a message brokering system whereby you have a as a group of servers which manage where data is pushed to. It feels like a bit of a non-problem to me, but I'm not an expert. I, I've definitely done some work in this area, but not a huge amount. Um, and I'm working to improve that myself um, so I can understand it better. But on the surface, I don't understand why we need, apart from obviously load balancing, why we need a, a, a group of servers to just simply pass a tiny packet of data. Like we may be talking... If, if we were actually knew what we were doing, we might be talking about 100 bytes of data in some cases, maybe even, you know, certainly less than half a kilobyte. And the problem with Kafka as well is that it's written in Java. I, I dare anyone to go and have a look at the source code for Kafka. Um, it is supposedly open source, um, uh, open source by the Apache Mafia. Um, it's, it's just absolutely indecipherable. Um, and there's no reason why it has to be like that. It's complicated, is the point I'm trying to get across. But that's the first stage, ingesting your data. Second stage is doing something useful with that data from typically what would be a JSON payload. Um, I know highly inefficient, but that's pretty much what we're working with most of the time is just JSON sent over the wire, probably not even compressed. Um, and then that, that there's a process which is applied to that data, which is called enrichment typically, where metadata about that piece of information that you've been sent, that event, for example, is is extended, is added onto the message. Um, and that's done with a program called, or, or a, a um, library called Spark. Streaming is another part of that, where basically the processing is done not in batches, but in supposedly real time or close to real time. Um, now, again, this is another complicated area. Um, Spark is based on a library called um, Hadoop, which is based on a concept called MapReduce, which started out at Google. The idea behind MapReduce is to reduce your 
your workload into two separate tasks, which is a mapping task, if you're familiar with functional programming, and a reduce task. And the idea is to run this task on a cluster of computers. Now, the genesis of Hadoop was that uh, AW, it, it was mostly going to be run on, on cloud, cloud computing, so AWS um, and Azure. And at the time when these libraries were being developed, um, the hardware which was being used to run, um, you know, that could be used for clusters or sort of uh, cloud computing was not very reliable at all. It's still not reliable, but it's, it's better now, certainly. And so MapReduce or Hadoop, sorry, had this idea of fault tolerance that if any one node in your cluster went down, um, it would be fine. And so there's a whole load of, load of code and behind the scenes stuff to make that possible, um, which is known as the Hadoop file system uh, and Zookeeper is, is the effectively the message brokering system that they use. So not only do we have one message brokering system in Kafka, but we also have another one in Zookeeper. Now, Spark is built on the, now I should say, Hadoop was built on writing basically most of your steps out to disk to ensure fault tolerance so that if basically everything went down you could pick up your cluster again in reality it never ever ever works like that if your hadoop cluster fails for whatever reason which does happen a lot you would just start the whole thing again you start a whole job, job again basically it's unavoidable um spark is is the idea is to instead not write that out to memory it's to write it sorry not that right not to write that to disk it's to write it to memory that's it um, it does a few other things as well, but it does those things badly and added a whole lot of confusion to, um, again, a, a fairly complicated task. You know, there's multiple moving parts in dealing with a file system on a cluster, et cetera, et cetera. You know, cluster computing, is, it's complicated. Um, even despite, despite the fact it's a complicated problem, the source code for Spark is so complicated, I don't think there's anyone in the world who could claim that they understand the whole code base. It is just absolute object-oriented programming hell from start to finish. It, you, you can pick any one class of the source code and it would take you an incredibly, incredibly long time to understand what that class is doing and, and why, just simply because of the, the hierarchical structure of, of these object-oriented programs. Um, I think that this is another thing that could be simplified and should be simplified to the point where, um, in a slightly more old-school way, maybe we could get to a stage where each company is running their own, doesn't need to use Spark because they they have their own effective tool in place. Because 99% of the code base that comes along with Spark, you probably don't need. Um, and you lose a huge amount from using Spark as well. You lose a huge amount of your resources and you lose a huge amount of um, customization. So now... Uh, I'll, I'll keep this as brief as possible because this is going to become a long presentation otherwise. Storage, we're talking about databases, is probably one of the better areas of this. You know, databases have been around for 60 odd years. They're fairly decent now, I would say. It's probably one of the areas where I have the least pain on a day to day basis is using SQL um, or moving data into databases. It's not too bad. Analysis. So, this is now that you've got your data in a database, um, you now want to take a look at it. You want to process it in some other way, some statistical or, or analytical way. Typical tools for that are um, what are called Python notebooks or, or R notebooks. And the primary language used for these uh, or for analysis is sort of the Excel spreadsheet. If you're a simplistic, uh, you know, doing simplistic analysis or R, which is a statistical programming language and Python. And Python is going to be coming up a lot. I will be talking about a Python a lot because it is by far the most used language, the most utilized language in data science. And it's not a good language. It's not an appropriate language for this goal, in my experience. Um, I think it's there for histori it's used for histor historical reasons. Um, you know, this is the way that software has developed. It's more coincidence that things become the way they are. Um, I think we need to stop at some point and say, well, let's think about what we're doing here. My person, I don't, I, as a bit of context, I've done a fair amount of analysis, tasks that could be considered data analysis in the past. Um, as a precursor to doing modeling. My choice is R, um, and not because R is a good language at all. Base R is absolutely horrendous, but there are a series of libraries which make doing analysis in R um, extremely fun. It's, it's, it's honestly, the it, it makes data manipulation incredibly um, pain-free. Um, RStudio is also a fairly re robust tool. Um, I have a few gripes of it, but 
I don't have too many complaints about R Studio. Unfortunately, most people don't use R in R Studio because um, when people come across R, they come across the base language, which is just horrendous. It's 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 just awful. Um, so it has a bad reputation. And so using things like pandas um, and uh, Jupyter notebooks in Python for analysis is just absolutely painful. It's a process I detest, but I have to do it. Um, now, moving on to the sort of the more interesting part of things. But by the way, I should say, um, I think that 90% of the analysis that's done in data science uh, and in, in business is a waste of time. So there's, there's multiple statistical reasons for that, I think. Um, if you're interested in that, then definitely read up about Nassim Taleb. Um, obviously, a controversial fig figure, but his book, Statistical Consequences of Fact Tales, explains a lot why um, analysis and a lot of machine learning um, statistical analysis is a total waste of time. Um, fortunately for me, there are things which aren't waste of time, such as um, you know computer vision type tasks, natural language tasks, um, which means that I still have a job, um, essentially. And so moving on to that area of things, where which I've sort of labelled as modelling, quote unquote, which is where you have done some sort of um, initial analysis of your data. You feel you are comfortable with it enough to um, turn that data into or transform that data into something useful. Um, example would be a image classification algorithm, uh, which you then want to host on an app or a website, whatever you want. Um, and that's the goal, really, to take that ingested data and to produce a model which is going to uh, solve some problem for you. Um, I, I think data science is far too focused on analysis. Um, I think if we just told people, don't do analysis, don't even think about it, and just think about modeling, just think about what output you can actually produce from a set of data, we we'll probably save ourselves a lot of problems, but we don't think in that way. Um, it might be a long time before we fully come to terms with the fact that statistical analysis in businesses is, is mostly a waste of time. So there are other things that exist around modeling, um, which are essentially there because people don't know what they're doing, um, if I'm absolutely brutal. So containerization is a term that you might have heard uh, or you might be familiar with, Docker. Um, Data engineering is, is sort of filled with these these types of tools like Docker. The reason why Docker exists is because Python is horrendous by and large. Um, most of the Docker, most of the containers you're going to come across are running Python code, at least for me. Um, and the reason why that problem exists is because the, the, the Python ecosystem is just absolutely horrendous. There's, there's no reason why we should have to suffer such a terrible uh, way of working where um, nothing works in a backwards compatible way and no packages work with each other. If, if we didn't have such a reliancy on um, packages, there would be no need for this. Um, well, th there'll be less need for it, but Python probably still makes containerization necessary in some cases. And then you have things like Kubernetes, which means, which, which you need to manage another tool. So the tool which was meant to solve your problem needs a tool to be manageable. Um, you know, it's ridiculous. Cloud is another area which most of us have no choice but to use nowadays. Um, I would contest that the vast majority of businesses' use of, of cloud technology is, is totally inappropriate. Um, dealing with the quantities of data, which I typically have dealt with, um, you could run on a laptop. You could do everything that you see here on a laptop um, if we had appropriate tools. Um, now, obviously, you don't want things running on a laptop, but you probably want them running on one server or maybe a couple of servers. Uh, with load balancing, et cetera, et cetera, for different parts of the problem um, in the cloud. But um, cloud computing is also taking us in a very dangerous direction, in, in my opinion, which is of a obsession with infrastructure as a service. Um, sorry, not infrastructure as a service, um, data science as a service or things as a service. So we're now getting to the stage where every single part of this process is being, that I've explained here, um, is now a service, essentially a service in AWS or Google Cloud. Um, the problem with that is no one will, we'll get to a stage where very, very, very few people actually understand how any of these things work. Um, there is nothing you can't do, perhaps the analysis, but I'd say that's superfluous anyway, which is not a managed service on AWS. Um, and this, what I found is happening increasingly is that people were using things like Kafka um, and then they their business grows or they reach a scale of data which things are starting to creak, creak. And instead of understanding how to use a different tool or understanding Kafka better, God forbid, um, they, they say, no, we're actually going to 
go up one level of abstraction and and, and instead of writing code, we're just going to use uh, a service on AWS to manage our ingestion problem, for example. Um, so they understand, instead of trying to understand their problem better, they actually end up understanding their problem worse and just throw more compute power at it. Um, I don't believe this is a good way to go for many, many reasons. One of them is, is environmental. Um, we don't need all of this compute power. Um, CPUs are massively underutilized. Um, people don't write software thinking about cache coherency or, or um, the pipeline stalls or prefetch queues and all those sort of things, um, which are the things I would like to think about. Um, and we're getting worse at it. And so maybe this is an opportunity for some to come along when, when you know, these systems fail and sort of say, well, this is how you actually do it. But increasingly, we are becoming totally brain dead in terms of the, the, the work that we do. And then finally, because you have a complicated infrastructure on your AWS surface, because you're using so many services which have to talk with each other behind virtual private networks with different endpoints and different security and, and uh, different resource groups, uh, you then have to use um, another tool to manage that whole mess that you've created. So instead of just having one or, or a set of uh, a set of compute uh, servers running, you know, in a secure environment managed for you by a company or, you know, somewhere in Europe or where or you know around the world, we now have to have we now have to basically use code to manage. We now have to effectively manage our whole infrastructure and how these things hook up with each other. And so there's a tool called Terraform or a, 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 a sort of a, a, a small programming language called Terraform, which people use to write down their infrastructure on AWS and so they can destroy it and build it back up again if necessary. And on the surface, this sounds like a good idea, um, but one, you have another tool to think about. Two, it doesn't do everything you want it to do. Three, um, you then have to manage the, or the program has to manage the state of the application, i.e. it's a stateful system whereby it's remembering what your AWS infrastructure looked like before and then checking if something's gone down so it can bring it back up for example if you want to use it in that way um it's, it's just complexity that shouldn't exist we, we shouldn't be creating systems this complex um or we need lighter touch tools i mean obviously running a cloud a cluster on a you know a supercomputer cluster is complicated um you need something to manage that in a way and you know to understand when things go down um i'm just not necessarily sure that um we need all of these things in all of this all of the time. So that was a very long winded explanation of, of the state of data science, but um, and I've tried to rattle through it as quickly as possible so that you don't get bored. But um, I just want to explain that it's, it's a complicated industry um, with lots and lots of moving parts, which no one fully understands. I, I mean, my background is in mathematics. Um, so I've always focused on the analysis and modeling and learn, you know, I've done a lot of programming, so I'm comfortable working with things upstream, but you know, my day-to-day -day life is in sort of this realm, the analysis and modeling. Um, most people don't understand all of these components. Um, and that's a problem because we need people who can understand those. And there are things that I don't understand, which I'd like to understand as well, i.e. how Spark works under the hood. So I mentioned Python, but considering we're talking about programming languages here, I, I think it deserves to go into some depth. Python is a very, very, very bad language. And it's not Python's fault um, because it wasn't designed to be used to solve the world's uh, machine learning, deep learning challenges. Um, I find it unbearable working in Python. And fortunately, I don't have to use it on a day-to-day -day basis um, by design. I, I've made it so that I don't have to. But um, lots of people I know do. And I certainly have to use it on a weekly basis. And it's just totally unpleasant for writing code, debugging. Um, you are constantly waiting for code to run because it's so slow. Um, packages and package management is just absolutely horrendous. Deploying code, as I've come across, um, is, is just an absolute nightmare because nothing works. You end up having to containerize everything. Um, and all of the tools to do anything reasonably complicated from a sort of mathematical perspective um, are, are are, are, are complications as well. Um, you take NumPy, for example, is a library used for scientific computing, or really vector vector mathematics, essentially. Um, because obviously Python is slow, it's it's a, um, not even JIT compiled, right? It's a dynamic library, a dynamic language with very, very weak type system. Um, 
you can't do anything complex in a language like that, really, or in any reasonable time. So num the goal of NumPy is effectively to marshal computation to um, C code. And so as a result of that, when NumPy doesn't behave in a way that you expect it to, or you don't know the intricacies of the language, for example, things like broadcasting, which is an easy concept when you get your head around it, but it's certainly an advanced concept. Um, your code is very, very difficult to debug because you just have all this guff. I mean, you just really want a, a vector of floats. You just want an array of floats to deal with, for example, most of the time. And you want to perform operations between pairs, triples, or single uh, arrays of floats or doubles. And Python immediately makes that difficult to do in any reasonable time where whereby you can actually feel happy and productive and, and like you're getting things done. So I hate it. Um, a language that takes indentation so seriously should not be probably the third most popular programming language in the world now. And the reason why Python has become popular is because everyone is taught Python now. Um, if you do a computer science degree, you'll probably end up doing some Python programming. Um, and it's not, it's not appropriate for that. It's not appropriate at all to do anything serious in. And um, I heard Jonathan Blow saying this the other day that these languages allow you to do um, fairly complicated things fast. Um, like for example, creating a neural network um, or training a neural network, that should, that's a complicated thing under the hood. They allow you to do it fast, but then when you want to do something slightly more complicated than it, the overhead is so huge that it's, it's, it's incredibly painful. Um, training or doing, in the past I've tried to do customized things with recurrent neural networks, which is a slightly more um, complicated type of neural network. In TensorFlow, which is a Python library for neural network programming, it was just absolutely disastrous because the language that TensorFlow was not designed in a way whereby I could, um, could transform it in a way that, or, or utilize it in a way that I needed to for my particular application. And so by building a neural network library or having a simpler neural network library, um, it means that if you come across a concept which is difficult to express in your current syntax or your current paradigm, um, you can probably change the library. So but this isn't possible with Python, essentially, because you're totally relying on everyone else's code. And that's why you get this package management dependency help, because you're just running everyone else's code. 99% of the code that you run, you probably didn't write. So how does Python fit in with data science? Um, it's, it's almost ubiquitous. Um, the only stages where it hasn't infested uh, is really an ingestion. Um, Kafka is written in Java, I believe. Um, mostly that's, um, but everything else after that point is is done in, in Python. So Spark, originally written in Java because uh, Hadoop was written in Java. They now have PySpark, which is a wrapper, a Python wrapper around that. So you can imagine what that's like programming in. Um, uh, databases have thankfully managed to stay clear of that, although there are still some you know, very slow database solutions out there like Cassandra, which are written in Java. Um, but um, you need a special sort of query language to use them, which I'm sure has Python binding. And then analysis is mostly done in Python um, using notebooks, pandas, um, scikit-learn. Uh, and then modeling is, is almost exclusively done in pandas, uh, sorry, in, in Python. Um, and this is terrible we, because no one understands how any of these things really work. Um, and they're incredibly slow um, and difficult to, to I mean, I, I'm sure all of you who are interested have seen Casey trying to build TensorFlow on Windows. It was just an absolute disaster. Um, and then, as, as I mentioned before, containerization is basically necessary for data scientists because of, um, of the fact that the Python ecosystem is so horrendous. Um, so it's, it's got its dirty little mitts in, in many, many aspects of the data science tool chain. Um, and that's because it's a simple language that people can get up and running with fast. Um, it's not useful. It's not expressive. It's not, uh, it doesn't help you. It doesn't make your life enjoyable, but we have to use it. And so I just illustrated a case in point of why uh, Python, uh, some of the Python scientific programming libraries are horrendous. Um, and here we have a class for PCA. So PCA stands for Principal Component Analysis, um, which is effectively a way of taking a very high dimensional data set and building a representation of that data, which is lower dimensional. And, and this is useful because um, you may be able to compress that data in a, in a way such that you, you retain information that you need. 
Um, it's all useful because it may actually uh, reveal some underlying structure in the data. Um, I say it's useful. In reality, it's not actually useful. Um, Nassim Taleb uh, has, has a, a useful part um, in his statistical consequences of fat, fat tails, where he explains why PCA fails in all but the simplest cases, i.e. Um, normally distributed data. But let's pretend that PCA is something that's actually useful to do. So PCA should just essentially be an operation performed on a matrix. There, there's, there really should be nothing more to it than that. Um, there is, for starters, we see we have a class. Um, there is absolutely no need to have a PCA class. We just need a PCA function or procedure. Um, so if I want to understand the PCA routine in scikit-learn, which is where I got this example from, um, I then have to understand a class and I also have to understand base PCA. Um, it's an absolute mystery to me why PCA needs to have a base PCA. Um, I know there are various types of PCA analysis, but why can't you just have individual instances of, of uh, well, not instances, that's a bit loaded language, but in, uh, individual functions for each of those types of PCA. So now we say, right, what's base PCA? And um, we find that base PCA inherits transformer mixing, um, which I still have absolutely no idea what it is, and base estimator. And you can see here it's an abstract class because of this thing, meta class equals ABC meta. Um, so we're into you know, immediately slow code if we want to, you know, do do many, many um, PCAs over time. And then, so transformer mixing is a mixing class for all transformers in scikit-learn. Um, I don't know what a transformer is. I've been doing scientific programming and mathematics um, at a reasonably high level since I was 19 years old, which is safe to say a long time ago, well, not a long time ago, but at least uh, 12, 13 years ago. I have no idea what a transformer mixing is. And so I go and have to discover what that is just so I can understand the PCA code. And then we have to have this base estimator uh, class inheritance, um, base class for all estimators in scikit-learn. Um, I don't know why this is necessary, why there has to be some abstraction of an estimator, um, but there you go. It's complicated, uh, even doing the simplest things in Python, um, and your code is going to is guaranteed to be slow. So, going back to the state of data science, we, we sort of diverged, di diverged into why Python makes things bad, um, but let's just go back another level and, and sort of have a look at these things, these, these stages to working in data science and, and give them sort of a a, a um, traffic light rating. Um, data ingestion in Kafka gets an amber because it seems bad, but I'm no expert. I, I don't have the authority to say, well, this is bad, but you know there are good reasons why it's bad. Um, it seems bad. I've done some uh, network programming uh, in my time, just dealing with TCIP, TCP packets. Um, it didn't seem that complicated to me. I don't understand why we need all the complexity. I've done some work in um, zero MQ as well. Um, which seems a reasonable middle ground, much considerably faster than Kafka from the benchmarks I've seen. So, but I don't know. I'm no expert. So processing and streaming, I do know a bit more about, and I can tell you it's an absolute red flag. The whole uh, the whole code base is, is, is certainly millions of lines of code, um, and it's a nightmare. No one can understand that. And really, most of the time, your data, most companies' data does not warrant that amount of, of, of code. Um, most people could transform um, 20 gigabytes of data a day into a useful format with a laptop. Um, and I've produced um, software in the past which has done that, which has transformed terabytes of data, of J terab terabytes of string um, JSON in, in reasonable periods of time. In, in, you know, we're talking about several hours on one computer. Uh, and then analysis, again, is going to get a red. Oh, sorry, I, I skipped storage, but... Storage gets a green. Databases are fairly reasonable, I think, now. Um, I don't have huge complaints about databases. They are complicated, but I think uh, we have some reasonable database solution, solutions now. Um, analysis, um, R Studio and R gets a green for me personally because I enjoy writing code in R using um, the Tidyverse, if anyone's interested of, of what I enjoy. But everything else is, is an absolute uh, red, um, bad. It's not fun. Um, to do this type of analysis. It's way, way too complicated. Um, analysis for me is one of those areas that needs high level concepts and, and, and doesn't need performance most of the time. Obviously there are cases where it does, um, hence the reason why I asked to be on the beta for um, Jai. But working with high level abstractions over small 
code base, uh, small data sets, i.e. anything less than a gigabyte, is is fun. It's frankly fun to transform data in this way. And most code that I write will run in under a minute. Um, otherwise, I would get bored and twitchy. And then modeling is an absolute red again, as we are um, we are in this nightmare state of no one understands um, the libraries that we're using in this case. And we have this whole issue of marshalling data between different programming languages. Uh, TensorFlow uses C++ behind the scenes, and then which is also using CUDA, so you need the CUDA compiler to use it. Um, and that seems bad. It seems bad to people understanding how these things actually work. And then obviously containerization is bad. It's, it's just a solving a problem which shouldn't exist. Cloud is bad because AWS want to maximize their profits, understandably, so um, they make it attractive for you to use their services, which is bad because no one understands them. And then infrastructure as a code is probably borderline amber, but I'm not a fan of it because if we didn't build such complicated systems like Netflix do, for example, um, if they had you know reasonable, if they had games programmers, essentially network games programmers probably working at Netflix, um, you probably wouldn't have the absolute microstructure hell that they have or microservices, sorry, hell that they have at Netflix by the sounds of it. I am, I'm not up to date in that situation. Maybe it's different. So finally, um, a bit more positively, or well, not finally, because um, we're nowhere near the end of the presentation. Uh, why I think Jai may help. So it seems to me that there is a desire in data science and machine learning, AI, whatever you want to call it, data engineering, to use one language to rule our whole ecosystem. And so Python is used because it appears on the surface that you can do complicated things quickly. Um, and, and the assumption being that if you want to do things slightly more complicated, Python, it will also be easy in Python, and that's not true. Um, but there is something about using high-level concepts which is attractive, and you know, obviously I use high-level abstractions all the time to do analysis and various things. But sometimes, a lot of the time, I want to do low-level things. Um, for example, running over you know, a simple mathematical operation over an array, I want to do something um, low-level with that. Writing a neural network library and um, backpropagating the gradient, I want to do that with a pointer to a, a float, uh, you know, a pointer to a float, right, essentially. So I posit that we need a language that is sometimes low level so we can be close to the hardware. Um, that would be a case where, um, you know, writing a cluster computer is very, uh, uh, a, sorry, a cluster computer system is necessary to have low level access to the hardware because you don't want operating system interrupts all the time and you want to have all the memory because you know there's going to be no other software running on your cluster. Um, so you need to be able to interface with the hardware as a lower level as the operating system will allow. Um, you don't want to be running that, in my opinion, on top of the JDM. But sometimes we want high level concepts so that we can express compl complicated concepts, sometimes when appropriate, uh, quickly. Um, an example of this we'll go through of um, something that I've built. And I think the the abstraction over building a neural network, which is using a system called automatic differentiation um, to build effectively a DAG, a directed acyclic graph, is a useful one. Because unless we're going to hand write out the gradient of a neural network, which is not easy, uh, I've, I've done it for simple neural networks, but not for complicated ones, it's too hard, um, like an RNN. I, I struggled to write down the partial derivatives of a um, a LSTM node. It, was, it took me hours, literally hours. Um, so being able to use automatic differentiation to produce um, or to train neural networks is a really, really useful abstraction um, and something that we, I, I don't think we could really do without in, in terms of our use of um, artificial intelligence today at, say, Google. And something which I think Jai will really help with as well is um, the, the, the philosophy behind the language of drastic simplification of our systems. Um, I hear Jonathan Blow and, and others talking about this frequently, that our code, uh, the, the code that we're running behind the scenes, and, and Casey as well talking about the 30 million line problem um, in that presentation, if you've seen it, um, we need absolutely drastic simplification of these problems if we're ever going to survive, or if we're ever going to build anything new at some point in the future. At uh, some point, a lot of organizations will start to look like Twitter. Um, 
and data science organizations, complicated ones, large scale ones, will start to creak. Um, and I'm sure that there are ones out there now which are creaking currently um, because their model deployment system is so complicated. Um, the difficulty in deploying new models quickly or doing um, or changing up their data engineering pipeline is that the barrier to, to changing that is so high that they probably won't bother. Um, I know there are firms which are still productive in this space, but it's going to happen at some point. And I want something which is more pleasurable to work in on a day-to-day -day basis rather than Python. So if we look at the things where I think the JI can help, it can certainly help with a great deal of them. So an ingestion library could absolutely be written in JI. Um, I know networking isn't a huge priority, um, but um, it would be easy to port, I think, at least um, relatively easy to do something in terms of POSIX, uh, using the POSIX networking libraries in, in JI. Um, so I think we could write something nice, which wouldn't be as low level as, say, dealing with um, you know, TCP IP packets, but you know, so not too far away from that, and, and maybe as low as that when necessary. And we probably don't need the level of abstractions that we get with, say, something like 0MQ all of the time. Maybe you can decide that. And maybe if it's easy enough to do networking in a programming language, um, that maybe you build some of those features into your networking, your ingestion pipeline, um, and maybe you don't. But having ownership of that code base seems like a reasonably good thing to have, because then when you double the size of your business, you don't have to then go to AWS to just use all of their infrastructure and it costs you 10 times the amount it was costing you before. Processing and streaming, again, um, definitely can be helped with JAI. Um, most of those streaming operations can be expressed in a fairly high level way, um, but although it would be an absolutely massive project, a huge undertaking, um, rebuilding from scratch data processing or and streaming without the Hadoop file system, um, without the huge, huge bloated mess that Spark is, um, it's absolutely right up Jai Street, I think. Um, and I'm sure the other features of Jai's language would really help with that process as well, when necessary. Storage, I think is fine, as I've covered before, so I won't go over that. Analysis, um, I think this is, again, this is a bit of a borderline issue. Um, but I think when you get to the stage of doing analysis on very, very big data sets, um, having to work with, I, I, I say, okay, I should carry out one thing as well. Databases are mostly good. Some databases are horrible. For example, Pig and Hive, which are built on top of um, MapReduce are horrendous. And so if you're doing very, very large scale data analysis using Hive and Pig behind the scenes, it's gonna be an absolutely horrendous process. Now, I think our studio is a good solution. It's not perfect. Maybe there is a way of using some form of JIT compiled um, at JAI to do data processing or analysis in a way where we can utilize some high level features of the language and the compile time metaprogramming uh, and maybe reflection if necessary to do some analysis. I don't know. I know I'm going to try this. I, my next goal um, is to build a data frame library in JAI and see how that works. I don't know. I'm, I'm planning on building low level experiments and seeing how they work. I'm not totally wedged to this idea. I'm just proposing some things that seem reasonable to me. So maybe not, maybe so. Um, time will tell. And then modeling is absolutely an area where Jive will help massively. And I hope to demonstrate that to you very, very soon, um, in particular with neural network modeling and everything else. Everything else in scikit-learn could be a much, much simpler library in Jai. Um, and I think one of the most exciting things about that is something I'll go over in a moment, is the, um, the compile time execution. Because the vast majority of times that I write a neural network, I know at compile time what that neural network looks like. Um, there are obviously times when that isn't the case, and you should be allowed to you know, fit a model when you don't know it. But a lot of the time, I'm just literally hard coding a model. And in that case, why can't we take advantage of some compile time features? Maybe, I don't know. And then onto the other things, we won't need containerization anymore because hopefully our code base will be simpler and Jai will just run on multiple different platforms with very, very few packages, um, all compiled into the executable. Seems like a massive advantage to me. Instead of having to pip install all of your packages and then getting, oh, this version of um, 
the uh, the SQL uh, wrapper for Python is not compatible with Python 3.6.9, um, and so your code doesn't work, and then you have to go and containerize the whole thing. Cloud, neutral on it, but it will be simplified to some extent because um, your code will be simpler and you'll be using less resources because you've got less code and it's more efficient. And so therefore you can use smaller instances and you maybe don't need to even worry about load balancing now um, with your ingestion pipeline because it's just one box, maybe, I don't know. And then infrastructure as a code, um, I would posit that the compile time features of Jai would make infrastructure as a code almost superfluous because when you compile your executable, perhaps you can ensure that your cloud infrastructure is all absolutely in place and up and running. Um, and that way you can just do it all in one language. You don't need Terraform anymore because everything is written in Jai. Um, maybe that's a bit too crazy. Maybe it's not. I would contest that it's not crazy because making a whole new programming language with um, things that we don't understand behind the scenes going on and edge cases which don't work and crazy things like SQL injection necessary to just add a table to the uh, database that you've created um, seems seems bad. Right, so I have no idea how long I've been talking for, but it seems like a long time. So I'm going to get on with the demo. And this demo is of a neural network library. And so what I wanted to build was a very small proof of concept neural network library uh, in Jai and get it running um, and see, sorry, to see and see how fast it could run and see if there are any features of Jai which made that process interesting, pleasurable, or just not even that, just you just just fit into the way that I want my software to work or with you know my, my program languages to work with me. So um, this particular task that I'm doing here is pop count. So by the way, I should say um, I've I've certainly borrowed a lot of code from the um, CAN neural network library, um, I think, which is Attractive Chaos, uh, which is a GitHub repository. I'll put a link to that in the in the description below of the video. Um, it's a very, very good um, neural network library written in C, more powerful than mine, certainly by, by a long, long shot. Um, but this is something I've produced in uh, effectively a week. I'd like to note that getting a uh, neural network up and running, all of the code for this just exists in one file. It is less than a thousand lines to write a general purpose, um, extensible neural network library in Jai. Um, I think that's 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 a great indication of simplification. Um, this has uh, several dense layers. It has several hidden layers. It's using value activation functions. It's using root mean squared backpropagation behind the scenes, cross entropy, um, uh, loss, uh, a loss function. So this is a proper fully fledged neural network um, to perform pop count. So pop count is just basically counting the number of bits in a binary version of a number. Um, so let me just run it. I apologize for using uh, Visual Studio uh, code, but there you go, that's life. So this is the release build that I'm running here. So it's gonna be fairly slow, but there we go. And there you can see it's ticking away. This is something that needs to be fixed in the language, by the way, um, where if I wanna put a percent after something in print, which would have been three percentages in a row. It defaults to put in the percentage at the front, um, but there you go. So this will just tick away. This is running on a single thread um, on a spud laptop um, and there's 64 epochs and we've got our classification error and class error down to uh, a fraction of a percent. So that's a good indication. Um, so going over the network of the, the structure of the network, we can see it's incredibly simple and very declarative the way that we've defined the network here. So I have a compute uh, graph here and all I'm doing is I'm adding layers one by one into my DAG effectively, and then I compile them into my compute graph. And this reads, just for comparison, just I would say even better than something like what you would see in TensorFlow. So this is a similar sort of model where we've got um, but th this is this is for an image data set, but you can see the idea of you know adding layers and layers in a sequential fas fashion. Um, there's a lot of guff. It, it it's not it's not fun to read this. I'm not enjoying looking at the sample of code. I'm enjoying even less looking at the code on the right hand side here. Um, but I would say that that is in a low, effectively a language that is quite low level. 
that is a a very pleasant level of abstraction that I can achieve over what you know what I'm thinking about in my head when I'm building this neural network versus what is actually going on behind the scenes. And so this example works. Something you'll notice here that I've wrapped this in a in a code declaration. Now the reason why I'm doing this is because uh, and inserting the code that's trivial. It just inserts this chunk of code. But maybe in the future, it, wouldn't it be great if you could do this? So this compute graph has a, a procedure on it called a fit fit model, and maybe we can because we know everything about this this neural network at compile time, like I was saying before. How about we just compile some information about that neural network, i.e. the fitness function, into the graph itself, or the computation itself. So instead of having a general purpose uh, forward propagation, back propagation, um, automatic differentiation system, couldn't we have something which was actually customized to the neural network itself? I haven't implemented that, but what I have done is in a similar example, this is a um, a similar, a, a very, a smaller scale um, automatic differentiation uh, library, I suppose, or, or proof of concept that I built, which is just doing a, a load of you know multi, uh, manipulations to a pair of numbers. This actually does compile the um, compute graph for this automatic differentiation example, and so this is actually what the added strings looks like for that particular example. And you can see here that effectively all it ends up doing is just adding entries into arrays um, based on that computation, which is drastically, drastically faster than having to go through the rigmarole of, of you know, dereferencing pointers to nodes and figuring out what types they are and figuring out if you need to do the computation now or if, or if it's, you know, if it's been marked for evaluation, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not saying necessarily I will do that, but it's something that I'm definitely going to explore after I've added in multi-threading and um, added in the you know integrated a BLAS library, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in terms of GPU utilization, um, this is something where I would like to talk to people in the community about it, but um, CUDA is not a direction I want to go simply because um, the compiled, you have to compile CUDA code in using NVIDIA's um, compiler. I don't really want to do that. Um, so OpenCL seems like a more reasonable option. I'm no expert in this by any stretch of the imagination, but you guys work with GPUs all the time and probably know better than I do um, about how that would work. But it seems to me that using OpenCL may be a better option. Um, ultimately, at the end of the day, I would like to generate um, the actual assembly instructions on the graphics card um, would would seem would would be a really absolutely rapidly fast way to go. Um, I don't know how to do that. Maybe that's a stupid idea, but I would like to give that a try at least. And then I can have a neural network library which I can use for the rest of my life, which can work on uh, maybe even multiple GPU devices. Um, and I understand every single line of code. Um, you know, there is nothing else. This is all of the code for. I mean, I can even show you the function which does fit model. So these are the nodes in the operation. You can see here they have a forward pass, backward pass, all of the standard stuff that you'd expect in a neural network. Where is the code? Maybe I should just search for it instead of scrolling. So this is the effectively the meat and veg of the application. And you can see it's, you know, 100 lines, maybe even less, that actually trains a neural network. Um, I understand it. I know what's going on in this code, whereas I couldn't claim to understand anything about the TensorFlow library, having tried multiple times. Um, so that is a very, very small demo. Um, by the way, so CAN, which is what this library is roughly based off, I've certainly um, translated a lot of the concepts in CAN um, and reduced the size of the code base as a result of that. Um, CAN does run faster than this in release. Um, that's absolutely fine as far as I'm concerned. It's it's certainly comparable performance, um, but I feel that can can would be difficult. It would be difficult to make can work in CUDA or with a GPU, uh, and it would probably be difficult to make it their multi-threading ex more extensive. But I don't have that fear so much with Jai. Um, I think it's in a much better place to do that, quite frankly.
So I t intend to do that and make it more powerful than can, um, which is an excellent library. But um, by comparison, if you were to look at the declaration of a uh, neural network in CAN, it certainly doesn't read as, it's close to, but it's certainly not as nice as this, um, which, is, which is comparable with any other neural network library that I've used. So that's that demonstration, very, very brief demonstration. So next steps for me. Um, I would love to get some feedback on this. Maybe I'm, it's a load of nonsense. Maybe everything I've said is um, wrong. <laughs> um, I, I feel that I need something to make my life more tolerable as a data scientist and to reduce the costs of companies I work with and work for um, and to understand their code bases because I don't like the direction we're going in. It's, it's, it's less sustainable, not more sustainable. Um, and I don't mean that in an ecological way, although it's that as well. I mean, in terms of adding to the code base, adding, you know, making, building new interesting things in the tools that we have. So feedback would absolutely be appreciated. Any feedback on OpenCL would be absolutely brilliant. Um, what I'm going to do is when I get some spare time, I've, I've done this totally in my own spare time. When I get spare time, I will build a very simple analytics tool in Jai. Um, and you might be going, that's not what the language is used for, or it's not designed for that. But um, I think with a bit of help of understanding um, or, or, or playing around with, with the actual, you know, the syntax of the language, um, I think that could be an option. And I'm going to make it, I'm going to make a graphical user interface for it as well. It's not going to be anything complicated, of course, but it's going to be able to do basic data manipulation and processing in Jai using a hopefully fast, fun tool um after that i will consider what's next but hopefully at one stage i will have something which allows me to do ingestion processing streaming analysis and modeling in one language and be able to deploy it to cloud environments god forbid but i have to do these sorts of things um without with all in one language and so i understand every part of the code base um and it will be fast, it will compile quickly, and life will be fun. So thank you very much for listening to this long-winded, uh, probably boring explanation, and um, I look forward to discussing this with all of you. Bye-bye.